Hello people of YouTube. I am getting a bit fed up with the endless discussion on inheritance laws in Islam, which is why I want to see if I can establish some facts and de-emotionalize this discussion. I'll start off on Wikipedia, which in some areas has become an Islamic propaganda platform, but here it stays a bit more factual. It points out the differences in interpretation and application between different Islamic groupings such as the Shia and Sunni, as well as the different schools of jurisprudence, the Fiqh. The summary is that the three verses mentioning inheritance rules are seen as a starting point to be applied by Islamic scholars or experts. What remains in Islamic jurisprudence is the principle of agnation, i.e. the preference of male succession and deductive reasoning. So, no mention here of absolute rules, precision and eloquence of the Quran. From the general information on Wikipedia, I go and find more in-depth historical background about inheritance and women to check if Muslim claims are correct that Islam added to the rights of women. If I look at these four statements, they seem familiar. Do they belong to Islam of the 7th century? Nope, it's 4,000 years ago in ancient Babylon. Women here have dowry and property rights, and we see where Jews, Christians and Muslims get the idea of the eye for an eye found in all their holy Bibles. What does the law say about women in Babylon? It confirms my hunch that women were regarded second class and objects, but had certain rights even when it came to inheritance and owning property. Let's skip a few hundred years and go and see what the Jews thought of this. A paper by Mary Radford shows a very similar picture where women had certain value, their dowry and some basic rights. I will not keep all the text up here on the screen all the time. If you're interested in the details, the links are in the box. Moving across the Mediterranean, we go to Greece. During the times of the Athenian lawgiver Solon, we have texts describing various laws, giving women basic rights. Hmm. In the property dealing, sisters and aunts were included amongst those who can inherit. Women, therefore, could inherit property. Who would have known? What is funny is that Aristotle said things which I find copied into the Quran. I think the authors of the Quran agreed with his statement that women were less capable of controlling their impulses and emotions than were men. <laughs> Looking at the next door neighbor Rome, I found text stating that as early as the 15th century BCE, it was common practice for Roman women to be able to own their own land, write their own wills and appear in court as their own advocates. An emancipated woman legally became sui juris or her own person and could own property and dispose of it as she saw fit. From the late Republic, a woman who inherited a share equal with her brothers would have been independent of agnatic control. Moving on down to Egypt, if we use Google a bit, we find that there was an ancient Egypt under Pharaoh's rule, very little difference in law between males and females, as both had the same rights on inheriting and owning property. And we see that uh, daughters could inherit and it had equal rights so in Egypt also. Looking at the general picture outlined in a paper on women and property in ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean society says ownership however remains with the wife. Their value must be restored to the wife on dissolution of the marriage through death of the husband or divorce. She then remains owner of the property during her lifetime after which they are reserved for her children. Even in Arabia women had rights before the Quran came around. Islamic commentators ignore all of this and simply claim in most of the early societies and ancient civilization, the right to inherit the deceased properties is often given to the eldest son and male relatives. Hmm. Female relatives are given lesser right to inherit and most of the time their right is denied. Complete, total and utter nonsense. Then they jump to the 19th century bringing up British law, the same approach that learned Quranic Arabic used. It seems to be standard practice and the preferred path of Muslim apologetics, even if it is totally irrelevant. But they don't research and present facts about the situation of women in the 7th century, and don't present an honest description of the present day situation of women in Islam, where everybody knows about a really basic fact that a woman is not allowed to enter a mosque through the same door as a man, even if she wants to pray to the same identical God. 
Okay, so let's turn to inheritance proper in the Quran and check whether it is worthy of a god. What it involves is several steps. First, you need to match the actual situation within a family after the death of someone described in the Quranic verses. Then you need to identify the classes and groups within the family. Now you can match the people with the hierarchy and the Quranic framework. Lastly, you execute the mechanical workings to establish the actual shares of an estate. If I go and cull the Quranic verses down to the essential contents, I'm left with a handful of scenarios. 411 has, well, children, the male, the parents, the third to the mother, then in 412, the husband, the wife, the brother, the sister, and, and so on. And then lastly, 4176, we only have two pieces of information which are left. But when I look at this reduced version of those three verses, I have some immediate questions. If I look at the women above two, two thirds, one, then to her a half, does this refer only to daughters or women in general? Why this unclear wording? What is the ruling on the share if there are only two daughters, not more? Because it only says above two and one. The case of two is not covered. Just to put the cat among the pigeons, what if a widower dies with only a daughter and a son, where the son is not a Muslim? A third to his mother if no children. Well, what of the father? Why does a sister in 412 get one-sixth, but half in 4176? Who decides on what basis whether a sister receives half or only a sixth of the inheritance? All these controversies and solutions using consensus of opinion or universal agreement amongst the Sunni Muslim jurists are pointed out on Islamic sites such as Islam 101. They also make a very clear statement. If there is a child or agnatic grandchild amongst the heirs, then each of the parents inherits one sixth. Hmm. Let me for a moment assume that the Quran was written by a God and is perfect. Then my old example of three daughters and two parents and a wife should be easily solvable and provide a clear answer. Well, if I, well, just me and myself, do the maths, I get two thirds plus the third plus the eighth, which is equal to, oops, looks as though I must be doing something wrong. So who will solve this better than Muslim scholars and experts on Islamic inheritance who hopefully receive direct guidance from Allah? Expert Dr. Hussein Labib explains, a primary school kid can calculate it very simply. Three daughters, two thirds, the mother, one sixth, and the wife, one eighth, and the father will take the rest, one twenty fourth. What? What does Allah decree? Parents, a sixth each if he has children, not one twenty fourth. Why does this expert ignore a Quranic decree from Allah? Who or what gives him the right to modify a law from the Quran? Has he never heard of 3336? It is not for a believing man or a believing woman when, well, the, 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 the duo, the team, Allah and his messenger have decided on a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about the affair. And whoever obeys you know, Allah and his messenger has clearly strayed into clear error. Hmm. Another expert suggests that because the inheritance has already been distributed, the wife receives nothing at all. Maybe because she is mentioned later in the Quran as the daughters and all community debts? There are multiple discussions on numerous forums, one example of many such as here. They all show that scholarly intervention is required. Human intervention. Now let me confront an Islamic inheritance calculator with the same scenario. We see the values for the parents, the wife and the daughters, and even if you don't immediately know what one-sixth is in percent, I think anyone can see intuitively that two-thirds are never equal to 59.26%. So there is some sort of adjustment taking place. Why? Well, let's try a second calculator. This time I tried a commercial calculator. You need to pay for this. Does it make it better? Entering the values and hitting enter produces the result and shows the working. The calculator realizes there is something wrong with the Quranic verses and adjusts it using human logics and brings the values down to the same levels as the previous one, which was free on the web. The same applies for the next one I found. I enter the values, hit calculate, and after some waiting for the calculation, voila, the same oversubscription which is manually adjusted until it fits the required total of one.
looking for further calculators, I was constantly directed to the same two sites which I've been using in prior videos. I repeat the same steps for both. Here I get a slightly different result as the daughters get reduced to 1681th and the wife is simply reduced to 1 9th. Has anyone read anything in the Quran about a share with a value of 1 9th? <laughs> this is the detailed explanation, which in my eyes does not make it any better. Finally, I entered the same sequence into my favorite calculator but received much of the same. Just to verify my understanding, I went to the scholar site and read up what the shares of three daughters should be. Two thirds. And not 1691th or anything other than two thirds. It is really strange that all calculators seem to work on the same principles, but never according to the Quran. The explanation, as is so often the case, is in the fine print. Here we see that not the Quran and the will of Allah and Muhammad is what is used, but human interpretation. Comparing the different calculators, this is what I get. A discrepancy between the Quranic decree and everyday application. All I'm doing is applying the Quran. If I were to use the approach learned Quranic Arabic suggested, the daughter should get two thirds and then the rest should be divided using the remaining estate. Yet the portion of the daughters mentioned first in the Quran is also reduced, which is the opposite of what he suggests. Are all experts, scholars and programmers stupid? I also get a discrepancy between the calculators and scholars, which results in different scenarios and results depending on whom you ask. This shows it is very clearly an inherent flaw in the setting up of the prerequisites and premises within the Quranic verses. What gives? One thing I see is that at least the electronic versions are consistent. Consistently wrong. So unless someone can come up with a coherent calculation, along with the plausible explanation, I will treat the Quranic mathematics applied to inheritance as faulty. At this point, I need to apologize to learn Quranic Arabic as his claim that, according to the Quran, the male does not always receive double what the female gets is actually correct. It's only the implementation that does not recognize this and women are awarded half a man's share in real life. But he is correct. The Quran itself does allow equal shares for men and women in some cases. Well, here's the conclusion then. We've seen that the authors of the Quran tried to establish a ruling on inheritance which had, up until then, been a tribal issue and consisted only of local customs. This was undoubtedly an honorable attempt. Looking at the history of inheritance of women during that era in the region, we find that a claim that the Quran added a formerly unknown dimension to inheritance for women is unfounded, something I've already demonstrated in my textual criticism video number three. The mathematical execution of the verses in the Quran shows a flaw in the definitions. Even Muslim or Islamic scholars and experts come to different results as the instructions are faulty, which shows very clearly that the Quran was created by fallible humans and not a perfect, all-knowing God. <laughs> I wonder if this really is the final discussion on this topic. Well, thank you very much for your time. Oh, and P.S. I'm half following a script suggested by the rationalizer. So if you want to complain, go talk to him. If you like the approach, you are more than welcome to tell me. Cheers.